just wanted to get up here and really tell you about what this is. Have you heard, has anybody heard about this yet? Yeah? Anybody plan to go to this yet? Yes? Get some hands up in the air. Yeah? Okay, so what, what is Foundations, right? And what we've put together as a team here at my church is a course of seven studies, right? And it's basically what it is, is Foundations about what it is to follow Jesus as a Christian, right? And today we're starting with the Bible. And what are we going to be looking at? We're going to get down to the very bones of it. Like how do you read your Bible? Where do you start? Where's the index? All of those very foundational things. And it's not going to stop there. There's going to be an hour of just teaching about what the Bible is, how important it is, why do we use the Bible. And so if you're available for second service, these classes will be rotating for the next uh, seven weeks. There's seven courses. And as you can see, you can pop in any one of those seven weeks and just be filled up with a great teaching. There's so many teachers that have dedicated and been prayed for and been praying themselves about these courses. And they're actually in a year of making. So we started this in October of 23, started praying about this. And, and we have some people that are really dedicated to it. We just want you to have this opportunity to, to see all the work that's been put in. But we know that God is just going to reestablish some of those foundations for us. So if you're interested in that, there's no sign up. You simply go upstairs uh, for second service, room 212. There's lots of signs that um, just take away all the excuses that I couldn't find it. And if you need more help, just come find one of us and we will take you there with, by your hand, okay? Amen? All right, second service, room 212 upstairs. Pastor Dusty? give you a little background real quick the uh, the foundations courses have been a continual growth out of what does it look for us look like for us to actually fulfill the Great Commission go make disciples baptizing people in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit that making disciples peace is something that I think we are doing a wonderful job of right now I think there's also a pieces of that that, man, our, our discipleship specific, some of those pieces don't cover some of the like first step things. They might be second step things, some of those. And if you have been raised up in the church, a lot of those foundation pieces, maybe you <laughs> assume that you have those or that, you know what, I know how to read my Bible, I'm good. You know what's really good is getting a refresher on how to read your Bible. Okay, and so uh, getting into that uh, with the group that is leading today. Who's teaching today, by the way? Is it Ramon? Ramon and Zania? Okay. Um, Ramon, it, how many of you are at men's retreat? Okay, keep your hands up. Those around these, did you hear them worshiping this morning? Ooh. <laughs> All right. We had a great time at men's retreat, and Ramon actually walked through a little bit of how do we even do scripture memorization? Why would we do such a thing? And if, if that is something that you find that this week, if you look back and say, you know what? I don't even know that I opened my Bible this week. Um, I don't know. Here's an idea. Go to the foundations class. All right. Uh, be energized because Ramon is a guy that is energized about reading God's word and he wants to teach you how to do that and the other teachers that are part of this process don't want you to just kind of show up at church and go so what are we doing we want you to know we want you to engage we want you to grow spiritually in that process and a huge thank you to those of you that have been involved in that and will continue to be part of that um, this is not just a Sunday morning thing this will also be starting on Wednesday nights the Wednesday night will be a you're committing to go through all of them the Sunday morning is a bit more hey I'm here I, I would love to learn more about the Trinity what in the world how, how do I wrap my head around something that is so incredible yet so well revealed in scripture so grab onto those uh, as they come up on Sundays and if you are interested in walking through each one of those we would love to have you um, jump into the next round because I think this the Wednesday night one is full is it not it's closed for now um, but there will be another round after that as well so we'll we'll let you know on that one grab your Bibles we're gonna go into Matthew chapter 18 continuing our look 
at Peter's process of growth in his relationship with Jesus Christ and how it is that we see the infilling of the Holy Spirit happening in the life of Peter and how that might kind of also show up in our own life as we look at our interactions with God, with, with Jesus, and how we, we read our Bible and, and then live our lives accordingly. And so as we are going through this process, we have seen Peter fail. We have seen him come through incredible triumphs. And if you were at men's retreat, I think those are incredible triumphs. It was awesome. The first night we got uh, sent out by Rick, hey, just go out and ask Jesus to speak to you, which is a in, kind of intimidating potentially thing to do. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go alone into the dark night and ask Jesus to speak to me. Where there's snakes. What's that? I don't know what your experience, guys, that were there was with that. I know what mine was. I literally went and leaned up against my truck for a little bit and looked up at the beautiful night and just enjoyed that for a little bit. And um, I'm talking to one of the guys about um, there's different ways that each of us kind of connect with God, and uh, I love being out in nature. I love being able to see things that are absolutely gorgeous. They, to me, are evidence and proof of who God is and the glory that he can speak that into existence. I can't even speak a turkey sandwich into existence, but God can just, poof, and it's there, and I just sat in that, and I was like, all right, well, that's, that's about it. Time to go back. Didn't feel like any word from the Lord, none of that. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to walk down the, the hill a little bit, and John's house is up on this little kind of knoll, and it's a beautiful spot, um, but I just kind of wanted to get down a little bit further away. I could still hear some other guys moving around, that kind of stuff. I'm like, if I'm going to really get with Jesus, let me get away from all this, and went out there, walked on the road for a little bit, and still nothing, like earth shattering. Turn around and start walking back. And it was like I walked into the presence of God. Like, not like, oh, he surrounded me with warmth. Like, I bumped into <laughs> the, like, no, God's here, and I want to be with you, farmer. And it was like, okay, <laughs> me too. <laughs> I, I don't know how the Holy Spirit shows up in your life. Usually, in me, it's snot and tears, and that's <laughs> just how it works. But um, it was phenomenal just to know that, no, I am here, I'm with you, I am in this, and uh, I hope, gentlemen, that you didn't just feel that, but you really experienced God as we were together. Peter got to have that kind of experience with Jesus, but I think he also still had some questions, and it's a delight. I love it when people are asking questions. I really do. It doesn't, to me, indicate doubt or lack of faith. It indicates interest. I don't know if you recall when it was that you started dating your spouse. All I remember, there were a thousand questions. I want to know this person. I don't want to just ah, have the lovey feelings, but like really, I want to pour into this and make sure that I am not making some horrific mistake with the rest of my life. I want to know. And so when people are asking questions about God, I love that. And Peter asks a question to start this off. He says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And if you've never heard this before, this, this was actually kind of generous on Peter's part traditionally. Because there was a, a Levitical kind of command that was in place. It was not a biblical command. It was a traditional command from the teachers at the time that if you've forgiven somebody six times, you don't have to forgive them anymore. I mean, six times, that's a lot of times. And at that point, you just turn them over and they're like, nope, we're done. We're severing relationship. And it's an interesting question because Peter adds one more to that saying, Jesus, I know what the teaching is and I'm going to give one more. Is seven good enough? I want you, this is again class participation time, we try to do this on a regular basis, I want you to think with me. If you were Peter, why would you be asking that? Like, go into your own heart, go into your own motivations, think through that. When you get to the point where 
someone has wronged you enough times, why do you want to stop forgiving? This is honesty time. Throw it out there. Because it hurts. It is hard to forgive. It does feel useless when it has happened a hundred times, and you're like, oh, sure, you're sorry. You get tired. Yeah. Not seeing change is what we love as parents, right? I want my kid to stay the same forever. Especially when they're in that spot where it's like, no, please, I can't wait till you grow out of this one. That would be don't believe them oh you're sorry I've heard that before and then you did it again it is relationally expensive to forgive if we're actually doing it right it does hurt it does have a cost to it and we know that when it happens to us And what Jesus goes with here is an answer to this, is something that can be, if we allow it to be misunderstood, it can be discouraging. Why do we ask this? I, I do think that at the root of it, we want to stop forgiving because we are offended and hurt by the thing that keeps happening. And it's a legitimate thing to say, is there hope for the end of this hurt? There are so many times in our relationships that it feels like change is an impossible hope. That if it's just going to be like this, I either have to learn how to live with it broken or let's swap it out for another one. And that, that thought, that idea, that kind of almost default for us to just cut ties and try something else. Maybe alone will be better for me. That's not what God said. God said it's not good for man to be alone. That's not just a man. Not just men. We were made for relationship with God and with each other. And relationship requires forgiveness. Relationship also requires repentance, by the way. But the side that Peter is addressing with Jesus is, Lord, as far as it is concerning me, how many times do I have to get hurt? I think is the question that, Je that Peter is asking Jesus. Jesus, with all encouragement, says, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. I usually lose count around 15 <laughs> so 70 times 7 I am a pastor so um, there's about 400 people in this room that's what we're counting for attendance today that's not true that's not how that works but it's fun to talk about and be silly with but this this thing that Jesus answers is not just another specific number that no when you get to that number then you can stop forgiving that's not even what Jesus is saying he's saying Peter stop counting it hurts to be in relationship with humans full stop It is expensive to be in relationship with humans. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are polluted with original sin. God didn't make us with sin. He gave us an, a choice to make. Am I going to do it God's way or am I going to do it my way? And man chose to do it our way. And that broke things. Because God's way is to continue in relationship. Man's way is to continue to protect self. 
And when we protect ourselves, we hurt others. And we can give ourselves all the excuses in the world about why it's okay to protect ourselves. And it helps us dismiss the fact that we have hurt others if I'm only doing it to protect myself. And all that does is pass on more hurt and more hurt and more hurt. And Jesus is teaching something to Peter who is trying, I believe, with his his whole heart to understand this Jesus guy and his way. And so he asks questions that maybe some of the other disciples are too afraid to ask. Maybe they've been talking about this in the background of Scripture and like, I don't know. How, I mean, the, the rabbis say six times. Some say even five times. But Jesus, we've watched this guy do some incredible things. Maybe he'll just need one more from us, and that will be what he requires. So, Peter, go ask him. Okay. I don't know if that was the conversation or not. But I don't believe that Peter is the only human in history that has asked this question. I think everybody that's ever been hurt has at least gone to God and say, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive this woman that keeps hurting me? How many times do I need to forgive this man that keeps hurting me? And some of you are going, yeah, I'm there right now. And Jesus says, ultimately, that the, the question that is being asked is asked from a position where you don't feel like you have enough to keep going. Right? We feel like our hope is in the end of forgiveness, that we don't have to keep forgiving. And that's not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in the one who gives us forgiveness completely and Jesus is redirecting Peter's attention from his hurt to his savior Peter don't don't even worry about being hurt you will be hurt it hurts to live to be alive is a process of dying and we hurt each other in that process but your hope is not in just the end of that your hope needs to shift. Jesus flips everything. And he is showing Peter a new way that everybody is hurting. The only way that actually works to fix that is not to distance yourself from other people. It is fascinating to me. The history of the church from which we spring is this holiness movement thing, and there's this, this incredible foundation piece that we believe wholeheartedly that everybody has to make a choice whether or not they're going to follow God. God gave them free will to make that choice, and he also has already made the choice himself that he wants everyone to make that choice, and so he's made it possible for everyone. But then there's this thing that in order to be holy we have to separate ourselves from our culture so that they can't pollute us and get us dirty and hurt us and so for generations the denomination out of which we come and which we are still part separated itself and moved to like chanute kansas if you've ever been to chanute kansas there's nothing in chanute kansas which was exactly the point Let's go there where no one can hurt us, where no one will think differently than us, where no one will have to be forgiven because we're all perfect here. (laughs) Room full of perfect people is what, what I'm seeing right now. I know all of you never have done a thing to hurt the person sitting directly next to you, let alone anybody else. But that is not Jesus' answer to this thing. His answer is people are hurt and hurt people will hurt you. Forgive. Full stop. Forgive. The only way you're going to love anyone ever is to forgive them. You know why we have like things like American Idol and we have these people that are just, oh, they're awesome, Beyonce, mm, I, all that stuff. 
because nobody gets to know those people for real except maybe some of the people right around it's easy to love someone you idolize because you don't see any of the negative in their life and that's not a real human when it's a real human that you have to have interaction with jesus is teaching peter and jesus is teaching us that forgiveness for real not in part not with an expectation like mm -hmm, yeah i'm just waiting for you to screw up again you big jerk not that kind no yeah i forgave you yeah it's we're fine we're good we're good it's okay no it's not there's hurt forgiveness does not cover over things and say no it, it wasn't a big deal Forgiveness says that hurt really bad. And I still choose to love you. And I choose to give you something that you can't get for yourself. You can't earn this. But I give you grace. This is what Jesus is pe teaching Peter right now. And then Jesus goes into a parable. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. That's what it says in the NLT. Uh, the, the, the Greek here actually says 10,000 talents. And talents are not things like, I borrowed the ability to learn to play guitar. Not like that type of a talent. It's, these are actual measurements of... Uh, of of weights what this is this breaks out to 375 tons of silver those of you that might be like "Ooh, the economy's bad let's invest in gold and silver anybody have 375 tons at your house no your house would fall to the not yet you're right your house would fall to the center of the earth i mean I would be shocked if this building weighs 375 tons to give you some perspective. 375 tons is not a small amount of anything, let alone silver. What Jesus is saying here is the debt that this servant has is unpayable completely. And I love what this servant says later on. No, I promise I'll pay it back. <laughs> okay, buddy. It's like our national debt. We'll pay it back. Trust us. We've got $459 trillion just somewhere else. Which, ask me later. Is that you, Mom? Hold on, I'll be right back. This is a debt that cannot be paid back. And it says that he couldn't pay back, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt, which wouldn't pay it but the man fell down before the master and begged him please be patient with me and i will pay it all in this parable jesus is still answering peter's questions how many times do i need to forgive and what jesus brings peter's attention to is this that we all lie to ourselves and god if we think we can repay our debt personally. That my sin, what I have done to offend God, can be paid off by me is a lie that we tell ourselves. And we think that, man, I, I get impatient because I've been hurt and it's expensive to forgive others, but I deserve forgiveness. Jesus, you remember... I was the one that announced to everybody else that you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And you even said that nobody revealed that to me except your Father in heaven. And so I'm Peter and I get a gold star, right, Jesus? Jesus? Um, right? Just waiting for you to respond here, Jesus. And Jesus is like, <laughs> see, no. You didn't earn that. You didn't earn that truth that my Father shared with you and you have not earned any forgiveness and you do not earn the right to put a limit on the forgiveness that you give, Peter. It doesn't work that way. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. I do not owe anyone 375 tons of silver. I do owe a little bit of money on my house. I would love... Uh, for that to be forgiven. Wouldn't that change 
the metric of what the monthly budget looks like a little? Who's the teacher? <laughs> Law? Yeah. But this forgiveness that has been given by this master, this master being God himself in this parable, Jesus is very clearly speaking about our debt to God and God's willingness to forgive us. God's answer is not repayment. The servant's answer was, be patient, I'll pay it all off. That's ours. God, I will be a better boy. I'll look at less porn. I'm going to get better at not drinking as much and being a violent person. I'm going to get better at not cussing every day. I'm going to get better at being jealous towards my neighbors. I'm going to get better about defending myself instead of defending those who cannot defend themselves. I'm going to get better. I'm going to pay you back, God, for your love. It's wonderful. It's, I love it. It's so warm and cozy, and I'm going to be a better boy. I can't be a better girl, so for you ladies, you can do that your, yourself, all right? Just some clarification there. Our answer is we're going to be better. God's answer is I'm going to forgive. Because being better at being a sinner doesn't make you any less a sinner. Doesn't make you any less broken. We're still broken. His standard is absolute perfection. The standard we try to measure ourselves against is, listen, I didn't hurt them as bad as they hurt me. The debtor came with an answer. He said, be patient, I will pay it back, which is an absolute lie. Can't do it. There's no way in the world you're going to repay 375 tons of silver. You buy a silver mine and mine it for the rest of your life, you'll never get that much out of it. You're not going to repay that ever. God's answer was forgiveness, not repayment. But when the man left the king, he went and went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. This, now we can understand this amount of money. <laughs> he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant repayment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little time, be patient with me and I will pay it, he pled. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in my encouragement to you is this, and I wrestled with this one a little bit because I was coming at all this in a very much negative way and an instructive way. <laughs> it was like, okay, farmer, chill out. Let's look at this for a little bit longer, and this is what I came to. I believe that we need to take God's way, not his place. Taking on God's way of forgiving instead of putting ourselves in the place of judgment and saying, you don't deserve any more forgiveness. I've forgiven you enough. It has hurt, it has cost me a lot. I believe that we ought to be taking on God's way. That if his answer is forgiveness, not repayment, then our answer for those who hurt us should be forgiveness, not repayment. You've heard the proverb, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. It's just, that's amplifying broke. It's, it, it's not making anything more right, but when we do it God's way, instead of putting ourselves in God's place, which, by the way, is, is what we do when we say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'll make myself the top of what is morally right because I believe that I am right. No. Jesus says God's way is to forgive. Do it his way. Don't take his place. Don't. There's such a danger with everything when we put ourselves in God's place. So much danger. We learn less when we put ourselves in God's place. I know you've never been around a young person that has assumed that they know everything. <laughs> and there's danger in that, isn't there? As parents, we know, like, oh, please don't do it that way. I did it that way. 
and I have a scar from it. So don't do it that way. Nope, I got it. Um, can we go to the hospital real quick? But when we take on God's way and say, I may not understand how to do this. I may not know why it is that God wants me to forgive this person again. Are you kidding? But because he said to do it, I will do it. God, this is expensive and it hurts me every time. But I choose this because you have chosen us for relationship with each other and with you. And the only way relationship works according to you, God, is forgiveness. And so I choose to forgive again. When we take God's way, we practice forgiveness, but when we take God's place, we bring condemnation on ourselves. And 31 says this in those almost very words. When some of the other servants saw him, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the, men, the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid the entire debt. When in the world, in prison, will you pay a debt of that magnitude? Never, ever. This is clearly Jesus speaking about condemnation and eternal separation from God, hell itself. Jesus is not mincing words here. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, there, there is no numerical limit that I want you to forgive someone else. I want you to choose ahead of time to forgive. I have this conversation with every single couple that I do premarital counseling with. I promise them. I actually have a crystal ball in my office where I can see the future. I don't have that. I just know that I've been around humans long enough and I can make a promise. You will hurt each other. And you will do it a lot. You will hurt each other more than anyone else will hurt either one of you. You have a more intimate relationship, which means there should be more trust there. And when that trust that is greater than any other relationship humanly gets broken, it hurts more than any other relationship. You will hurt each other if you are not willing today to choose to forgive what is coming in your future. Don't get married. You'll hurt each other. Choose now that it doesn't matter what that hurt is. You mean even if he cheats on me? Even if she has an affair on me? Are you kidding me? I can't forgive them. Don't get married. If you can't deal with the worst and you're just expecting the best, take off your rose-colored glasses. Marriage is hard. And marriage is just part of who we are humanly. But if we will do what Jesus shows us, that you're going to hurt each other, Choose now to forgive. This is not a marriage sermon, by the way. But it is one that with every human relationship, are we going to set a limit on how much we forgive and then be like, mm. now listen, I am not saying there should not be healthy boundaries in relationships. Not saying that. If there's somebody that is taking advantage of you, should you continue to give that person money when you know that what they're going to do with that money is going to be destructive to them? The answer to that is a hard no. There's a difference between limits of healthy relationship and when I'm going to forgive and when I'm going to stop forgiving. Do not stop forgiving. There's a consequence on us if we stop forgiving. We set the limit on God's forgiveness of us by when and how often we are willing to forgive number six is live free and abundant loose the cork of forgiveness 
don't meter forgiveness out like, mm, you've had a little too much forgiveness. You're getting a little forgiveness drunk around here like you're just expecting it. No. Take the cork out. Lose that sucker. Don't stop forgiving because that's how God deals with us. And I thank him for his forgiveness. This whole conversation that Peter has with Jesus, and I, I don't think Peter came at this from a bad place. I think he came at it from the same place that all of us come at it, that when we know that forgiveness is not just some easy thing to do, we know it actually costs us something. We feel like we just don't have enough to keep going if we're doing it on our own. It becomes a standard practice, though, that if I will go to God for all of my supply, it becomes significantly more likely that I will forgive every single time. But if I am looking at the person that hurt me to be my love, to be my supply, to be my everything, then forgiveness is going to be impossible because they're going to run out too. They can't make up the debt they have brought between you and them. You cannot make up the debt that you have brought between yourself and others or between yourself and God. And so his idea is not repayment and making it better. His idea is absolute forgiveness to say, I choose to love you though you chose to hurt me. Can we move on from it now? Can we learn ways that keep that from happening over and over again? Let's do that. That costs more even in the future to actually forgive. But it also restores relationship. That's what Jesus is about. And as we, this morning, are going to be celebrating communion. And there are pieces of this that I'm not about pieces of communion. There's definitely pieces of communion in here. But there are so many aspects of this. Uh, Ken led us men uh, yesterday through the process of, of communion, and it, it struck me yesterday that there is hurt that has been experienced that we can forgive because we can go to that person and have a conversation and restore relationship. But there's hurt that has happened in this room with people that we will never see again because they've already died. There may be offense that has happened to you by someone you didn't even know that you couldn't even track down. And Jesus takes that hurt as well, and he takes it on himself. It says that he took on the sin of the world. That, that weight... There's sometimes when I read scripture, I go, did Jesus say that because that's an exact amount? Was the weight literally of the sin of the world 375,000 tons? Did Jesus ever lie? I don't think so. He might, I don't know. That'll be a question I have when I get to heaven. Hey, Jesus, how heavy was the sin of the world? 375,000 tons. <laughs> Got you, boo. I carried that sucker. I took it on. It wasn't mine to carry. I didn't commit the sin that hurt you. But I am willing to own that so that you have somebody to forgive and somebody that will forgive you. How about you forgive like me is what Jesus is inviting us into today. Romans 12, 2 says... Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be renewed in your mind by Scripture. The pattern of this world is unforgiveness, retribution, self-protection. The pattern that God gives us is self-sacrifice. That He knows the cost. If it's 375,000 tons I'm misquoting that number, aren't I? I apologize. He 
He knows what He has forgiven you for. He knows that He also has forgiven the person that hurt you. And He's asking you to join Him where He is at in forgiveness so that freedom is there. And I don't care if you've committed murder. I don't care if you believe wholeheartedly that there are Nothing in the world is off of the table for you to choose. I, Jesus still loves you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to change your mind and how you think absolutely. That it would come in line with his word. And I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a thing coming up soon. It's called an election. And there's some crazy things afoot. And there are some pieces that as a culture our culture has gone so far from god i love that we have not been called to change our culture as a church we have been called to repossess it but that has to start here before we'll do anything outside of these walls and that starts with the renewing of our minds that if i still bring into god's church the thoughts that everybody else outside of this place thinks, then I need, I need to do some surrender. If I have spent more time on social media than I have in my Bible this week, there might be a good indicator that my thoughts have not been renewed. But my thoughts are being morphed by my culture. And if that's the case, then the things that we as Christians vote on will look a whole lot like the things our culture votes on. And that's just not okay. And some people get real offended when I talk about political things. I don't talk about it. I don't, there's in many ways I don't care at all who you vote for. I think there are some pieces of this ballot that are things that as Christians we ought to really, even if we completely lose, by the way, the likelihood of some of these ballot measures that I think are diametrically opposed to Scripture, the likelihood of them passing is pretty great. Well, then I'll go with my culture. Is that, is that our answer? I, I hope not. I hope our answer is actually, you know what, let's start with transforming the culture of us, of our students' lives. That we will have conversations about abortion that are different than the conversations about abortion that happen outside of these walls. That when we have those conversations, we include in that conversation a reality of the fact that God is God and I am not. And we ought to trust him in some of these pieces. And there are so many different lies around all of that that I just, I mean, we could spend hours going through that. But that's not the purpose of this morning. The purpose of this morning is coming to Jesus with our thoughts. And saying, Lord, I want to be one with you, not one with my culture. Teach me how to think. God, I want to be one with my brothers and sisters. And if that means that there is a confrontation of thought that happens. How many times do you see Jesus run away from confrontation of thought? Zero times. How many times do you see him deal with it with grace? It's really only with the Pharisees, the religious elite, that Jesus puts a smack down on people. But when it comes to real honest conversations, Jesus deals with those and says, you know what my answer is? My answer is to forgive and to keep God in his place and to keep me in my place. It's amazing to me how often Jesus said, not my will but yours be done. Even if it was just one, that's amazing. Maybe we should practice that. God, not my will, not my comfort, not my political position, but yours be done. Do I think we're going to change our culture? No. I think our culture is going to get worse. Do I think that God wants to change us? Do I think that God wants to change people in our culture? Yes, by calling him to himself. By giving forgiveness for things that people think are not even needing forgiveness, but God does. By being gracious, 
by honoring others and saying, listen, I love you more than I love my position. And so I will not just give up, but God, I'm going to give grace. And how do we do that? What does that look like? What Jesus showed us is it's dying himself and paying for the hurt that we cause. When we come and we celebrate communion today, I want you to understand that when you are receiving forgiveness from God, you may need also to put all of the hurt that you have carried onto Jesus and say, Jesus, I forgive you. And that may sound heretical to say, Jesus didn't do anything wrong, right? Yeah, but he took on the sin of the world. He took on the sin of the person that you cannot forgive in person. And how good is it to come into the presence of Jesus with forgiveness that he has given? And that also you come and say, Jesus, I can't even talk to that person again, but I choose to forgive. And you took their sin on, and so Jesus, teach me to forgive. Show me what that looks like to be one with you because of forgiveness. I'm going to stop carrying this hurt. I'm going to stop carrying the guilt that came with the offense that I did to somebody else. Scripture talks about us defending those who cannot defend themselves. And I believe we we talked a couple months back about a biblical position on when when life happens and, and how all of that breaks out and where we should fall in that. And I believe wholeheartedly that we ought to be trusting God. And do some research because there are so many lies that, oh, well, what if this happens? What about this? And all the fear that happens. Listen, from both sides, I hate it. Fear manipulation gets us nowhere. Trust in Jesus. And even if I disagree with what Scripture says, saying, you know what? I'm going to go with what Jesus says, what the Word of God says. I'm going to trust. Are there horrible situations that happen around abortion? Absolutely there are. There are. This Prop 139 thing is one that I'll tell you what, it opens the door for some pieces that I believe break the heart of God, but I think he he can heal all of that. Do I think it's going to pass? It probably will. Am I going to vote for it? I'm not going to vote for it. You may dislike me for that. Okay, I would love to have a conversation with you about that. Do I think that life should be in the hands of doctors? It's never been in the hands of doctors. It's always been in the hands of God anyway. Do I think life should be in our hands? I don't think we're trustworthy, personally. And so I'm going to default to what God says, that he's the one that gives life. He is the one that will judge all of us, and so I'm going to trust him with that. And that's, that's the position I, I, I fall to. And I think that there are so many scary things on both sides, and we can get so caught up in the fear when God has already given us the instruction that he knit us together in our mother's womb, that we are valuable to him. Let's take on the value that he gives us and believe that he is God, and we don't have to be. I want you to come to Jesus with your position, and I want you to ask him about it today. Do I want you to vote? Man, we have an incredible opportunity to have influence on our culture. Yes, vote. Be salt and light. You know what salt does? It slows the process of putrefaction in meat. Does it stop it? Nope. (laughs) But it slows it long enough, maybe, for some redemption to happen. We are called to be salt and light in a dark world that is rotting away. I don't care if that thought in some of those pieces 
don't change our culture. We're called to repossess with the love of Jesus Christ. Not the vitriol, not the politics of Jesus, with the love of Jesus. I want you to come to communion today. And if I have ticked you off today, I want you to come to communion today. If I have spoken all the wonderful words and I didn't go far enough, I want you to come to communion today. And let God be God and accept the forgiveness he has given you and give forgiveness like he has given it to you. Will you do that? I don't like this world, <laughs> but I love it because God loves this world. Amen. He made this world, and this world is broken, and he gave his son Jesus so that none would perish, but that all would come to salvation through Jesus Christ. And we have the opportunity to love each other in communion, to love God in communion, to accept his forgiveness and to give his forgiveness and experience a unity that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.